Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. With every passing day, Ukraine's choice between closer ties with the European Union or Russia seems more like a choice between good and evil, a democratic future and the authoritarian past. But is the choice really so stark? Well, to discuss that, we are now joined by Andriy Shevchenko, a member of the Ukrainian parliament and a strong supporter of European integration. Mr. Shevchenko, thank you very much for your time. Great to be with you. First of all, could you update us on what is happening in Kyiv right now? Well, we are at the Maidan of independence and uh, I'm right back from the parliament where we had a no confidence vote for the Ukrainian government. And as you already know, it failed. Uh, only 186 MPs uh, voted to, uh, to put the government down. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two reasons to, 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 to do this no confidence vote. First, it's the collapse of the association agreement with the European Union. And second, it's the bloody police attack on peaceful protesters mm -hmm. here on, on, on the Maidan uh, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. As we can see behind your back, people are still gathering uh, in the center of Kyiv. I wonder what do protesters really want right now? Are they still rallying in favor of the association agreement or they want something else? Well, uh, as, as you can see, uh, the, the Independence Square is already full of people and people keep arriving, as I, I can see on my left and, and right. This is the first reaction to this, uh, to this no confidence vote in, in, the, in the parliament, which, which failed. Actually, I think after, after this, uh, we lost uh, a good opportunity to start finding our way uh, of, out of the political crisis. Mm -hmm. So now the people here in Maidan, they clearly demand we want the president to step down. That's the way to solve the political crisis, mm -hmm. and that's the way to get closer to the association agreement with the European Union. You mentioned earlier the uh, brutal use of force by the police, and we've all seen the footage from Kiev, uh, and I think everybody, including President Yanukovych himself, recognized that the use of force was excessive, and as far as we understand, the investigation is underway, and before that investigation was even completed, the chief of Kiev police had to step down. So don't you think that in demanding nothing less than the resignation of the president himself, the opposition is being a bit too excessive in its demands? Well, as of the moment, we have heard some words, not too many words, and we have seen no actions at all. So not a single police officer has been punished or fired after this bloody Saturday. We have not seen the Minister of Internal Affairs in the Parliament. He was afraid to come to see the, the MPs. We have not seen a single uh, senior officer stepping down. So actually, people are so angry as of the moment because in the Parliament they expected that those who were responsible for this bloody massacre here on, the, on, on Maidan would be punished. That would be the first step uh, to get closer to justice. And we see, we, we saw no actions. So I think, I think for, for most of the people here, now it's absolutely clear that the, the president's party of regions, which did not vote for vote against the government, shared this responsibility with the police officers. So everyone here now understands that it clearly, it was clearly the president of Ukraine who gave the orders and who have to be, who has to be responsible for, for what happened here. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Shevchenko, the word revolution Revolution is back in use in Kyiv these days and one thing that we learned from the Arab revolutions over the past couple of years is that you know bloodshed can start with a couple of broken ribs and a few concussions but it can very quickly degenerate into people actually being killed on the streets and compared to what we saw uh, in Egypt or Syria, thankfully, the protests uh, in Ukraine and even the uh, police efforts to disperse that pro protest, was, all of that were relatively civilized. Do you think the worst is now over? Have you any concerns that if those rallies continue that there could be real blood being spilled in Kyiv? Well, there is one thing which makes the events in Kyiv these days very different from the Arab revolutions, and it's about the peaceful protests. Uh, every 10 or 15 minutes, every speaker who is on this stage at Maidan says to the, to the people, we are a peaceful gathering of citizens, we are not going to attack government buildings, and if you see anyone who who calls you to go and uh, attack the president's administration or a different building, 
that's someone who wants this revolution to, to, to be stopped. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, this is what makes this Ukrainian process very different from many revolutions which we saw in, in the Middle East. What makes this uh, event similar to the Arab revolutions, it's the anger that people have and it's the government which absolutely does not respond to what citizens demand uh, of them. Well, Mr. Shevchenko, as somebody who covered uh, Arab revolutions extensively, I can tell you that many of those revolutions started with peaceful rallies, but from the very beginning there were some people, some provocateurs within the crowd. And what we now are hearing, even from Western media, is that there, there are people in, in Kyiv who have been hurling rocks at the police, people who have been using heavy machinery, such as uh, an excavator on the streets uh, of Kyiv and there have been some attempts to storm government buildings. So can the opposition now guarantee that uh, people who have gathered behind your back will indeed abide by the law, that the protests will be carried out in peaceful fashion? I think, I, th I think you referred to one specific episode which happened on Sunday a couple of blocks away from this place uh, next to the president's administration. So as of the moment, it's absolutely clear that it was a provocation which was set up by the authorities. First of all, uh, there, were, there, were no, no one, uh, there were no protesters who were brought there by the opposition. There was a small group of radical, uh, the, there was a small radical group which had nothing to do with the peaceful protest on, on Maidan. Second, we know that most of them had a chance to go, to, to stay safe on the both sides of the police wall. Uh, when uh, third, we mentioned the excavator, and many people watch. Uh, many people could see this this huge excavator right in the center, right next to the president's administration. So think, not a single car could enter downtown Kyiv, but there was this excavator safely waiting for this crowd of radicals uh, next to the president's administration. There was a pile of stones uh, well prepared for that. So I think the opposition was really did something really good and important when. We went there and pulled some people out of there. Mm -hmm. So that's the only episode. Think about what we saw here on Sunday. About 800,000 people peacefully standing on the Maidan. Can you think about the crowd of that size? Uh, it, it successfully stayed peacefully here. And if you if you go to the Maidan right now, you would see a very peaceful crowd of uh, people. But uh, to be fair to President Yanukovych, he himself condemned the use of force by the police. He called it excessive. And uh, he also called uh, on the opposition to abide by the law and abide by the democratic procedures that exist in any democratic country. I want to play a soundbite from what he said and have you comment on that. Let's listen to what he had to say. If we want European standards, we must do everything within the framework of the law. This is the principle of democracy. Elections are coming. The people will decide. Whoever is elected, so be it. So essentially what he is saying is that if you want to be democratic, just be democratic. Doesn't he have a point? Uh, he, he's essentially asking you to either wait till next elections or wait until you have enough seats in the parliament to impeach him. But as of, as of now, you, uh, you don't have either of these opportunities. Well, uh, we have heard a lot of words from Mr. Yanukovych, and as I said, we have seen no actions. I'm not sure you would be the best, uh, uh, the best advocate for him, but this man has done nothing after this bloody Saturday to punish those responsible. Once again, not a single police officer was fired four days after, after the events. The Minister of Internal Affairs is hiding from the press and is hiding from the public. The Prime Minister came to, 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 to the Parliament and, uh, and was there enough to, to say that everything is fine w w with the country. So once again, President Yanukovych has done nothing. And I think for, for every Ukrainian, it's absolutely clear that he is completely personally responsible for this crisis that the country is, is in. And once again, our goal is a legitimate change of power. I think no one here wants a civil war. No one here wants a coup d'etat. We want a legitimate change of power. If Yanukovych feels confident enough, if he wants this country to get out of the crisis, let's do an early presidential election. But isn't it also the case that uh, the opposition at this point doesn't have enough 
seats in the parliament. Uh, Tuesday's vote, uh, no confidence vote in the cabinet, is one proof of that. And uh, on the top of that, you simply don't know how many people feel the same sentiment uh, that is expressed on Maidan uh, these days. So why not wait just a year to see uh, and to allow this, uh, you know, legal procedure, democratic procedure to take hold? Why do you, why are you calling for a preliminary elections, for early elections, uh, when certainly uh, the, 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 the full s scope of your democratic procedures haven't, hasn't been uh, exhausted by now? Well, um, I think we could start an academical discussion on whether people who clearly see that something terrible is happening to their country should wait for the next presidential or whatever election. But uh, I think it's not really what, uh, what we need to discuss as of the, as of the moment. Look, look what you can see behind my back. As of the moment, we can see hundreds of thousands of people staying here. It's the 11th day of, this, of the protests. As of the moment, millions of Ukrainians are on the streets around the country. And I think what we are, what we are witnessing is an irreversible change. It's an irre irreversible shift here in this country. But Mr. Shevchenko, this is exactly my, my point. Street actions may provide for very dramatic footage, but it's not an accurate measure of democratic aspirations. To measure democratic aspirations and whether Ukrainian people want what you, what you are calling for, you need to have elections, but uh, you, you have only a year until the next election, so why not wait? Uh, I think there are clear democratic tools which could uh, help us find the way out of this political crisis. First of all, if we have the prosecutor general office which is capable of investigations, that would help. If we have responsible police officers who could, who could quit their jobs, that would help. If we have responsible government which can fire those officers who did these crazy things, that would help. Finally, if we are talking about the parliament, the parliament could also do its part of the job, but it refused to do so today. But once again, every day that we do not do anything in terms of procedures, we, we are getting to, to a more dangerous situation. Mr. Shevchenko, I heard some commentators compare the current events in Kyiv to the Orange Revolution uh, a couple of years ago, and the most notable outcome of that revolution was, of course, the so-called pro-democratic forces with uh, Viktor Yushchenko and Yulia Tymoshenko. And yet the Ukrainian people, after th their coming to power, um, you know, fairly quickly had a period of disenchantment and they, they were voted out of power. So if the opposition manages to secure power once again, what do you think should be uh, done differently this time around to make sure that uh, people's aspirations are indeed met? <laughs> Well, uh, there is a lot of disappointment in politicians of all kinds here, and there is some disappointment in, in pro-democratic forces as well. But once again, if you think about the last uh, parliamentary election, the three uh, parties which are in opposition got majority of the vote, votes in the party elections. At the last presidential election, Yulia Tymoshenko lost to Yanukovych only 3%. So we, we can say that uh, Ukraine remains as a very competitive country in terms of politics. Mm -hmm. And as of the moment, the, the polls clearly show that people, people are not happy with what's happening in the country. Even before these events, only around 16% of the population supported what, did, what Jan Winston Yanukovych did. His approval ratings went to historical low, lowest, even in the east of the country. So I think, as, as of, of the moment, vast majority of Ukrainians clearly want changes. Okay. Mr. Shevchenko, we have to take a short break now, but when we come back, in Western media accounts, Ukraine often comes across as modern-day Cinderella, caught between the well-meaning European fairy and the exploitive Russian stepmother. Is reality indeed so black and white? That's coming up in a few moments on Worlds Apart. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing Ukraine's struggle for democracy and a better future with Andrei Shevchenko, a prominent Ukrainian journalist and politician. Uh, Mr. Shevchenko, uh, Russia has been accused of intimidating Ukraine and Yanukovych personally into submission and forcing Ukraine to turn its back onto a democratic dream. Why do you think Moscow is being so mean to fellow Ukrainians? Well, I think... Uh, 
uh, Russia and the Kremlin leaders uh, have been very pragmatical. They do want to keep Ukraine close. They do want to see Ukraine as part of the customs union. So I think the, their motivation is very clear for me. But I don't really think that it's going to change a lot of things here in, in, inside of Ukraine, because the vast majority of Ukrainians do want Ukraine to go to, go to the closer ties with the European Union. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, with this president or with a different president, I think we'll face the clear perspective of the association with the European mm -hmm. Union. Now, I heard your interview on BBC Radio the other day, and you said uh, there, quote, just a couple of weeks we thought we were about to become one of the European nations, and now we find ourselves under a newly formed dictatorship in Eastern Europe, something that you would expect in Belarus or sometimes in Russia. Now, I'm not going to even argue with you whether Russia constitutes a dictatorship. I think that's a very far-fetched statement. But um, don't you think that democracy is a bit too complicated than which trade union or which uh, agreement you decide to align yourself with? Don't you think that you give too little credit to your country of 45 million people by reducing it to a simple or maybe a complicated but a single decision like that? I think you are perfectly right with that. And uh, if you listen to most of the speeches here on the on the Maidan, especially in the very first of, of, the, of the Maidan, it was really about the bringing here the European values and the European practices. If we're talking about the association agreement, it's about 1,300 of pages which uh, do not mean changes right away. But for many years, both the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian opposition have been convincing the Ukrainians that the association agreement will be a solution to many problems. Fighting corruption, the rule of law, democracy and human rights, uh, efficient economy, prosperity, all those things could be uh, much easier to, to reach with the association agreement. That's what both the government and the opposition have been saying for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So now, with this, uh, uh, with this turn towards, towards Russia, Yanukovych did not just uh, throw away the association agreement. He stole this, this wonderful dream for most of the Ukrainians. Most of them really believed that, believed that we are beginning to build something what we have never had here, uh, a successful democratic country. But Mr. Shevchenko, I know that you have a very long track record of being an advocate of uh, human rights and speaking for uh, media freedoms in your country. And I'm sure you know that building democracy takes years and it is not up to you neighbors of Ukraine, whether it is Russia or the European Union, but rather to the Ukrainian people. So what stops them? Even with, um, you know, no agreement signed with the European Union, what really stops them from building all those liberties within their own borders? If we're talking about the Ukrainian citizens, uh, look, the polls clearly show that majority of the Ukrainians do want Ukraine to sign the association agreement. Even before the recent events, this number was more than 60 percent. Uh, only about 30 percent wanted Ukraine to join the customs union. So the proportion is clearly in favor of the, the European Union. I think the idea of uh, building a successful Ukraine without joining any unions, no matter whether it's the European Union or the customs union, is sometimes debated here in Ukraine. But I think it's absolutely obvious for most of the people who, who follow the situation in the economy and in geopolitics that it could be much easier in a close association with the European Union. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I would like to come back to this issue of Russia's uh, supposed uh, intimidation. The Kremlin's position has been that this, uh, this dispute is all about economy it, and that Russia believes its economic interest will suffer if European goods uh, will start flooding into Europe, uh, into Ukraine rather, and later into Russia tax-free. I wonder if you think that Russia could have protected its economic interest in some other way without applying uh, undue pressure onto Ukraine. Was there any other way to go around this dispute? Well, um, I find uh, some of the economic arguments that you mentioned quite artificial and not that profound. I think many people in Ukraine feel that this pressure was not just about the economy. It was 
pretty much about uh, geopolitics and pretty much about ideology. Absolutely, you know, Mr. Shevchenko, but let me Ukraine. let me stay on the on the question. Do you believe that Russia is within sure. its own right to protect its economy if it believes that this economy, uh, its market, is being threatened by the possibility of U European goods coming into U Ukraine and later on into I think Russia? That, uh, I think that Russia perfectly has the right to act according to its national interests as long as it does not violate the international uh, arrangements uh, that uh, Russia has made. Because, first of all, we have the framework of the WTO, World Trade Organization, and there were some clear obligations that Russia took, and uh, including that if there were some problems with, with the partners uh, inside of WTO, there are some instruments to solve that. Then, if you remember when Ukraine, when Ukraine uh, was giving away its nuclear arms, there was a special treaty, and Russia was part of that, which clearly said that Russia is never going to use economic pressure and some other kinds of pressure to influence the Ukraine's position. So many people in Ukraine clearly clear see that Russia, Russia went into the zone which was very close to violation of its international uh, obligations. But once again, it's not, it's not about, about just legal framework. I think it's much more about the way uh, this pressure was put on the countries. It was much more about the warden. So I think many people here felt that it was a very hostile action towards Ukraine. Well, and what is it about the warding and the way this pressure was put onto Ukraine? Because uh, as, far as, as far as Kremlin is, is concerned, it was very straightforward about what will happen if Ukraine indeed decides to sign this association agreement. And to the list of documents that you uh, mentioned earlier, I want to add the free trade agreement between Russia and Ukraine that clearly stipulates that Russia is within its own right to withdraw from the agreement uh, if Ukraine sides with, uh, signs any trade agreements with third parties. So uh, when you say that Russia violated some laws, this is actually not substantiated at this point. Well, look, I think uh, not to go into very close legal debate, which I'm ready for, I'm, I'm prepared for, but I think it's just part of the, of the situation, part of the problem. I think that both in Russia and in Ukraine, there were, there were more than enough people who were happy to exaggerate this conflict and to use the situation for both anti-Ukrainian or anti-Russian propaganda inside of the two countries. So I think that clearly damaged the relationship of, of the two countries. If we want to think long term, we should find a proper solution for cooperation of Ukraine associated with the European Union and Russia. And I think it's in the long term Russian interest to have a reliable, predictable partner here in Kyiv. Well, I think I would agree with you. And uh, one thing that Russia and the European Union definitely have in common is that they both want to have a prosperous and stable Ukraine, because uh, if this crisis uh, goes on, uh, all those people uh, will go either, you know, Ukrainian people will go either to Russia or to the European Union in search of jobs. So uh, I think neither Russia nor the Euro European Union would be interested in that. What do you think could be a compromise that would satisfy all three parties involved? Well, first of all, to all those uh, in Russia who can hear us, if you look at this Maidan, you should clearly realize that it's not against Russia and it's not against the Russians. And it's not against running away from Moscow. It's about solving our internal Ukrainian problems. Because people here want, your, want the European future as, as a good, prosperous future for themselves. So <clears throat> I think that for everyone in Kyiv, in Moscow, in Brussels, it's very important to, to find a legitimate solution here for Ukraine. But Mr. Shevchenko, there is one comparison going, making rounds here in Moscow, and Ukraine is being compared to a lady who, on one hand, takes money from uh, an old and ugly gentleman, but wants to spend her time with, uh, you know, uh, a handsome young man. But sometimes you, you really have to choose. I mean, you cannot have both. And it seems that Ukraine is, what you're really saying is that Ukraine wants to sit on the, on on two stools here. It wants to have this free trade agreement with Russia, which uh, gives Ukraine a lot of revenues. But on the other hand, it wants to associate itself both politically and economically with, uh, with the European Union. Don't you have to make your choices sometimes? Absolutely. You used quite a risky comparison. And uh, if you're using that kind of metaphors, I think you should clearly separate the present existing Ukrainian authorities 
which have been negotiated in a very embarrassing way with both the European Union and Russia and the Ukrainian nation. And I think if you think if you if you look at the at this at these people behind me, their aspiration is very clear. And you're absolutely right. It's about a very clear choice between the post-Soviet world and between the and between the European model of society. And we perfectly understand what we are talking about. It's corruption of the post-Soviet world, and it's the rule of law for most of the countries of the European Union. It's neglection of the human rights and civil liberties in the post-Soviet world, and it's a, it's a deep respect to human rights in the European Union. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're absolutely right. It's about a very clear choice, and I think in these days, this nation is really mm -hmm. making its choice. And I think there are, there are many commentators now in Moscow who believe that Yanukovych has indeed shown himself as a very unpredictable and uh, sometimes a very dangerous actor. You know, he spent, as you said, so much time negotiating uh, with the European Union uh, on the association agreement. He made a U-turn, a very dramatic U-turn uh, at the very last moment. He managed to put uh, Europe and Russia at the loggerheads. Uh, but. Um, do, do you really think that uh, this uh, portrayal of Yanukovych as, as a Russian Muppet in Ukraine is really justified? Because this is the way this, ha this uh, argument, this dispute has been portrayed in Western media, that Russia really wants to keep Yanukovych in Kyiv, which uh, many would argue is not in Russia's best interest. Well, I think if you portray Yanukovych as a pro-Russian uh, uh, pro uh, uh, puppet, I think it would it would be the right the right way to uh, to understand him. I think the only thing what he really cares at the moment is his personal interests. It's it's uh, he is uh, it's in the interests of his family, both in terms of his political influence and in terms of of the economy and of running business in Ukraine. Once again, I think it's personally Yanukovych who holds full responsibility on, on, of, about, of the political crisis here in Ukraine. That's the person who put the relationship between Ukraine and Russia into a very dangerous situation. And that's the person who put the relationship between Ukraine and the European Union into this very huge mess that we can see. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why, going, going back to the beginning of our conversation, most of the Ukrainians feel that this man should step down from his president's position. He is personally responsible for this mess that the country is at the moment. Well, uh, Mr. Shevchenko, unfortunately, uh, only time will tell whether this is going to, to happen, but we are out of uh, time right now. I really appreciate your perspective and to our viewers, if you like the show, please join us again. Same place, same time here on Worlds Apart.